negocio. Un atraco singular. Porque no vamos a robar el dinero de nadie. ¿Qué vamos a robar? I have a business proposal for you. A heist like no other. That's, of course, the professor from the Netflix series Money Heist, a show that on a lot of different levels connects us to my interview, my end of year wrap up interview with the very excellent Al Borealis from Forum Borealis. Now, the reason that I chose that clip is not because Al is from Spain. In fact, he's from Norway. But of all the podcasters I know, if you're looking for one that embodies that calm, compassionate, intellectual toughness with a vendetta mask wearing rage against the machine sensibility, well, in my opinion, there is one like none other. I don't want to be telling something that isn't true. So show me where I'm wrong, but don't march out your sacred cow and say, oh no, you know, it doesn't really matter. He's kind of right on this and shouldn't we all just get along <laughs> bullshit? Look, I agree with what you said. It's incumbent upon us to flush out bullshit because there's so much bullshit there. It, it comes with the territory because most people who are open to that, they are disillusioned with the huge main cult called society, the propaganda in the mainstream. So it's often like the, the less intellectual and academically trained you are, the more it's more like a belief thing. Okay, I don't believe these, so now I'm opening myself up to the counter. But the problem is the counterculture. It, it's not a f soccer match where you have two equal teams and you have to, like a tribalist, choose one. That's not what's going on. It's one huge cult and then there's everything else. Stick around for my end of year wrap up show with Al Borealis. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome my good friend, and I just firmly believe one of the best in the business podcasters, Al Borealis, we shall say, from Forum Borealis. And last year, Al and I had a terrific time doing an end of the year kind of wrap up show, which I had never done before. And when we did it, we said, we're going to do another one. So here we are. We're going to do another one. <laughs> so Hopefully that will be, be a tradition. I'd love for it to be a tradition. So Al, that's going to be my intro. If you want to do an intro yeah. of your own. You yeah. can do that. Like you just announced at your end, we are doing a mutual show today. So, except for this intro, they're going to hear the same stuff. Right on to that? That's my intro. That's it. I, I, I kind of think as a general rule of taking over the world, everyone should hear <laughs> the same stuff. That's got to be one of them. Quiero proponerte un negocio. Un atraco singular. Porque no vamos a robar el dinero de nadie. ¿Qué vamos a robar? Buenos días. The foundational kind of things. Oh, really? So how 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 socialist of you? I'm more <laughs> in in, in uh, let's have some things in common and then some uh, let's phase into it or out of it uh, individually <laughs> i think that makes spice it makes a difference uh, you know hardcore fans they'll listen to both <laughs> right on to that right on to that it's like it's like if we're musicians uh, it's like some of the songs are the same some are our own you know what right. i mean exactly mm -hmm. Although I don't know as well as you do because you're a musician and I am not. I, I'm which... not. Stop saying that. But uh, I d oh, last year we, we ended the show uh, with a song of mine. We did. Remember? Yeah. So um, that, you're, you're putting yourself under the gun. You're going to have to send me <laughs> a new one. original composition for this year. <coughs> we'll see. But folks, um, today uh, we're going to have this show, right? But... Not long, uh, not uh, in a long time from now, we're going to do another one. 
I hope. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say it to the people now so you're under pressure. And that's next year. Skeptico is 15 years old. It's become a teenager, man. Uh, almost legal age. And I, I, this needs to be marked somehow. So I've already concocted a plan. I'm doing the M Mr. Burns excellent hand movement right now. And <laughs> uh, that plan is uh, to go through with Alex uh, what I would call the skeptical journey. The skeptical journey, it's, it's a pretty unique show. He, he, I know you're going to be uh, bothered by this, but don't interrupt, just let me say it. Skeptical is a pretty re unique show out there for different reasons I'm going to tell you when we have that show. And uh, the journey is incredible, and I've analyzed it. I spent a few months analyzing the development, and I, I think I have a better survey of it than even Alex do. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that, Alex, and it's going to be so fun to pick your brain and get your reactions and your comments upon uh, different phases that you've been through and, and stuff you have achieved and done. So people, you look, you can look forward to that. It's going to be a super interesting show. We're going to, it's like always when I have Alex on, we talk about so many different subjects. And obviously we're going to do that here too. So it's going to be a good show. But apart from that, and this end of the year, I think I think that's going to be like how we are going to jive in the future. It's going to be shows like this, like a, mu a mutual show each year. Except when Alex releases a new book, then I'll have an on, on for that. Well, that's super nice, super nice of you, and I'd obviously love to do it. Th I do want to kind of interject here because for today's show, what I want to make sure we do is kind of stay on schedule for truly doing an end of year show because i've been on a couple of these and everyone gets mired down in covid which is understandable you know i mean it's like one of the biggest events of you know all our lifetimes you know looking back i mean it just is but at the same time there's other things going on you did a number of terrific shows pardon the pause there is all of l's shows from 2021 and there's really i've listened to all of them at least in really? part so i go through your shows and i listen to parts and if i'm hooked in then mm. i listen to the rest and if i'm not i move on yeah and good, good. that's just how we all have to do it because there's so much great stuff here but i learned what i really love about your shows is i learn I learn, I learn, I learn. I make tons of notes. I go and check out what you're saying, but it invariably winds up changing me and changing the shows that I do. So what oh I thought was good, do, man. It changes your paradigm. That's what I want to do, right? Yeah. yeah Thank no, you for I, that. I just have to be a sucker for all your little cheeky little uh, phrases, paradigm expanding and all the rest of that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it's a cliche, but it's true. I want people, to, and people often say when I launch a new show, they say, uh, welcome to class or, you know, something like that. It's like a pun. Yes. It's like a thing. People think they're getting educated. And that's, that's really uh, why I'm doing this. It's so, so fulfilling. It's so so fulfilling. I'm going to be trying to keep us on schedule here because you and I can yep. talk for a long time. Yep. So what I thought we would do is kind of start with going through your top three shows, moments, insights. They don't always have to be, this was the greatest show. It can be just, I got a little insight from this. From from your perspective on your work, and then I think I can weigh in too with some of mine as mm -hmm. well. So do you wanna kick us off with this body of work that is your 2021 published shows? Well, we start at the bottom. That's that's the beginning of the year. And then we do the same with you. And then we go to predictions. That's the fun thing, right? Perfect. But you know what we should do in addition to predictions? We should evaluate our predictions from last year. Damn, I forgot to warn you about that. I don't know if I recall them. Because when we do predictions, we have to be accountable for them. Well, yes and no, but they're <laughs> predictions. They don't have to be. <laughs> I, I can't. I, I will acknowledge that I don't have any precognitive abilities, so 
No, but, but okay. What what would be? Give me give me one of your top three Forum Borealis moments from 2021. Okay, so the thing is, what you're uh, watching now is the list of my uh, the forum work from 21. And uh, folks, it's one of my most productive years yet, probably except 15, I think 15 or 16. Or so. In the beginning, I was super, I don't know how I did it. But despite having published three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 22, I think is out now. I have like 15 to 20 unreleased. So I suppose they will be 2022 20, when they are released, even though they're recorded in 21. This problem isn't for skeptical because Alex usually releases a show right after he does it. Like this year, I released a show from 2016, I think with Harry Cooper uh, on the Nazi thing, uh, the Antarctica thing. So it's it, it's a bit confusing. Like, should I comment upon what I recorded in 21 or what I, I, I managed to release in 21? That's the question before I pick up. Published, published, published in 2021. Okay, okay, okay. So <clears throat> noteworthy stuff. We have Miguel Corner and Gnosticism. Then uh, You only have three, Al Rain. Yeah, yeah, but I'm name dropping while I'm going through the list here. Uh, <clears throat> Norse Roots uh, is pretty innovative. It's a, a unique show. You can't hear it anywhere else. Cracking Reality, I think, is one of the best shows for the more science-minded people. That was with Anthony Peake. I don't know if you listened to that one. Yes, I had Anthony mm. Peake on recently as well. Okay. Not sure I buy into some of his understandings of uh, brain chemistry and its relationship to these extended experiences. But yeah, he's got a lot of super great ideas. I, I love the guy. I've talked to him. Yeah. I had one on um, the gender stuff with Dr. Glover, Eliminate Nice Guys, Gnostic stuff again with Lawrence Carana number two there won't be re released until next year but that's going to be one of my favorites Cagliost recent release journals of Henry Sinclair if they are genuine again it's a scoop like the Norse roots to Freemasonry you won't find it anywhere yet although it's going to come as a documentary and books and all that stuff Operation Yggdrasil with Ola one of your favorite Pentagon's biggest secret with Nick Cook uh, here Hacking egregores. Let's discuss that one. This is one of my favorites. It's a new guest, Mark Stavish. But me and him go back a long way back. Uh, I, I, he wasn't that aware of that. <laughs> I made him aware of it. Then he connected the dots. But um, I think this is a special show for several reasons. First off, the guest is brilliant. He's a brilliant mind, although I don't agree with him about everything uh, in terms of interpretation, knowledge, etc. But that's just an advantage. But he's, he's, he's unique in that he's one of the few people who has published a book on egregores. And my show with him, I think, I've heard some shows he did on that. But I think my show with him is the best on that topic with him uh, at least from what i heard and he he recommends it to his students listen to that show take notes so i'm very pleased with that show and when i look at the evaluation in in my website the subscribers they can, they can vote vote for the shows uh, like from one to five and this is one of the most popular ones too okay why do, do you, you suppose that why do you suppose that is yeah i, I listened and, you know, kind of give people the overview, the egregore thing, and mm. how you think it plays out. I'd love to get level three on that because I think the, the idea is such a fit for so many things that we see. I'm just not so sure that we're not stretching the metaphor too far, you know. So it's a tulpa, it's an egregore, it's a daemon, as uh, Anthony Peake says. And it's like, yeah, that's something like that. But do we really want to lock into, you know, one definition of it that some guy has come up with? So tell me what you think. No, no, but he hasn't. That's the thing. Uh, what he did. I, I could have done what he did if I had the wits to do it. 
Because I have a similar background as him in terms of esoteric education from, uh, not, I mean, the, a very, very early one. And uh, he just realized, look, there's nothing on this out there. Let me collect uh, a bunch of info and get it out. And it was uh, that accidental too. He really didn't realize uh, which, what waves it, it was going to make in some circles, which it did. So I think it was a brilliant move from his, uh, on his part. And uh, there, there's not that much of his personal speculation. There is in, in terms of how it is implemented, how it is interpreted, because you can have a very clear concept of it and a clear idea of what it is. But from there to decoding the manifestation, everybody is on their own. Nobody can say it's like this or it's like that. This is this is it, right? So there I agree that it's going to be individual. But in terms of the understanding, uh, it's pretty mainstream uh, within. <laughs> it's a not very mainstream concept. And esoterica is not a very mainstream uh, layer of knowledge. But within that, He's not being very controversial. So uh, did you catch that? I did, and I apologize. I had my mic muted there as I was peppering a question at you. So uh, then why don't you tell us, Al, what you think it, it means to you briefly, and then more importantly, how you think it's relevant to what we're experiencing now? Because part of the place that it launches us is that reality is always in flux. The simulation hypothesis kind of takes merges with the egregorian in a very elegant way and nothing is really foundation that we can stand on and how do you how do you understand that relative to 2021 and what we're going through uh, obviously what we actually didn't get around to discuss uh, which we both lamented uh, and that's to do with COVID. i mean one egregore that I didn't see coming, which has been building up for years and years and years, uh, is the, you know, here in Norway, there are some differences to the American culture, but one negative trait with Scandinavia is that they've had this scientism, fetishism growing under the radar for so long. And uh, at some point, it just became clear to everyone that you can't question vaccines. If you question vaccines, you, you're going to be called an anti-vaxxer and you're going to be discredited and everything. So even s health professionals, science people, whatever, academic pe people who know stuff has to be very careful. And that's before COVID. And then the whole thing explodes. Imagine if COVID actually was like Ebola or something. Do you think, look, we, we, we're returning fascists from this uh, little experience we've had now. Imagine if, if the damage of uh, COVID, it wasn't just infectious, it was also acid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does, that, how does that relate to the egregore? Well, uh, I'll tell you, but we would have uh, camps, we would have concentration camps that would make Yeah, 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 yeah. How does, that, how does that relate to the egregore? How does that relate so, to the egregore? So the egregore is uh, uh, big pharma. You can't question big pharma. You can't question vaccines. You can't... Like Antony Fauci coming out saying, I am science. This egregore is, the, is an egregore that you've met, you met a, a related egregore, uh, from your early skeptical days when you were discussing with skepticism. It's a kind of the same energy, but it's on steroids and it's specifically um, going into the lane of health or, or, or vax. Uh, yeah, that, that, that version of it or that member of that of that egregoric family and that egregore is super powerful now. It's more powerful than anything else. You can you can just look at YouTube or Twitter or Facebook. The stuff you can criticize without being censored is now, it actually helped many other areas because before the pandemic, they were smacking down on so many different things that you couldn't touch. Now with this, this has become the number one taboo. 
so the algorithm is very busy removing people who who just opinionates anything about it. It doesn't. Okay, have to be I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and interrupt, yep. and people hate that. But to me, this is exactly what I don't like when I say stretching the metaphor, because we could approach exactly the same data points you're doing from any number of angles, from the technocracy angle, from the medical industrial complex angle, from all sorts of different dimensions. So when I hear you and Mark talking about egregores, first of all, my understanding of egregore is something that is made manifest by this collective energy. So it is this hungry ghost kind of thing. We go looking for uh, what was looking for me. <laughs> it's you didn't know that you were creating it, but you were creating it. Mm. I think there's an element to this that is happening right now, but it would be at this metaphysical spiritual level. We're not going to be able to nail it down with Fauci and, you know, all the rest of that stuff. And that's what I think we can bring to this conversation is kind of what would be the metaphysical implications as they relate to what's happening right now in terms of the where yeah. we're putting our collective energy and where it's coalescing and where it isn't and where it's all that kind of stuff. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? You got about yeah, two minutes yeah. and then we got to move on. Very important uh, clarification. So uh, egregores doesn't have to manifest in 3D. They normally manifest in a psyche, in a collective psyche. And so uh, they, they can be meta, uh, they're, they're metaphysical in, in causation, uh, kind of, but, but not necessarily in manifestation. So just this thing that if I'm going to write something on Facebook, something critical to COVID or vaccine, or I, I may, the egregore may kick in and I uh, may be filled with fear, for example, uh, inferiority. I'm not saying that happens with me, but uh, I'm self-censoring because the egregore is making me aware. It's a very powerful egregore, the COVID fear or the, or the vax worship. So these are manifestations of this egregore that is now dominating. And uh, there may be several, uh, and they may conflating and building up a bigger one. But the thing is, it's moving now in our culture. It's moving now in people's minds. And uh, I mention Fauci or, or social media just because it's a way, way to perceive this. In the earlier days, in the old days, <clears throat> if you're going to judge the climate, you have to go out in the streets, right? <laughs> now we're sitting behind computers and mobile phones. So that's why I'm using those examples of where we can see the zeitgeist, how the zeitgeist operates. But make no mistakes, the egregore is manifesting in these uh, vehicles too. Do you understand what I mean? Or was that too com convoluted? No, that's okay. So now it's my turn, because I'm going to take yep. this. Yep. I'm going to take it in a different direction. This, my dear friend, is an interview that I have coming up with Philip Fairbanks, author of the Pedogate Primer, and it's a political look at all this stuff. And we got to talking about this history and this important history with L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology, Stargate, but in particular, the connection to the occult, the esoteric, to Aleister Crowley, and to good old fashioned, I don't know why we call it American hucksterism, but we think it's, we proudly embrace the hucksterism that is in America. So let me play this clip and then we'll have a little chat. The only way to understand L. Ron Hubbard, in my opinion, and first and foremost, is a kind of grifter kind of guy. I mean, he's, a, he's yeah. a scammer and he's very good at it. And he's good at scamming people's money. And he mm -hmm. moves in with Jack Parsons. And the next thing you know, he's fucking Jack Parsons' girlfriend. His girl, and, yeah. And at the same and then, time, and then he gives puts him, his... Give him his money and, hey, would you also, now that I've got your girl, would you also give me your money, invest in a business, give me some boats? and stuff you know that's and a great he's like, story sure ron sure that's a whatever great... you say ron yeah and, and and you know so anyone who wants to reflect on that can say i know people like that i know people on both sides if whether you're the one being victimized or whether unfortunately you're the one who victimizes other people you know like i almost have to respect l ron occasionally because he comes from that like larger than life pt barnum 
uh, huckster tradition that's so quintessentially American. You know, what's more American than P.T. Barnum? I'm going to take a bunch of rubes for their money. It's just so, it's so insane that like they were going to do a sex ritual out in the desert. And they did. I think this is how he stole his girlfriend, I think, because like initially Jack Parsons was going to have sex with his girlfriend. He's like, wait, Jack, <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> I can have sex with your girlfriend and you could be the one who's like watching us and saying the stuff. You could be reciting stuff <laughs> while I'm having sex with your girlfriend, who we will later embezzle from you and have you start a business so that we can steal you. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. So when he does go out and perform these rites and rituals under the direction of Crowley, right? Because Crowley is in mm -hmm. communication with Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons, Parsons reaches out yeah. to Crowley and says, I'm your number one guy. I want to be your number one agent yeah. in, and uh, you know, uh, Crowley, from all accounts, has a little bit of that huckster in him, too. Oh, absolutely, you know? yeah. And, and and he loved Jack, apparently. I think that the that relationship ruined it. Uh, because when he saw, he's like, no, 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 that's what you do to the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't believe in that stuff. You get the other guy to believe and you take his girlfriend and his money and his boat. And that's woo -doo -doo -doo. that's the <laughs> trick. Like, and then you say abracadabra and, you know, or ararita or whatever uh, and, and call it a day. We're kind of dancing around this other aspect to it. Well, there's two other aspects to it. One is the CIA kind of big game stuff somebody's got to run the world and it ought to be us and his connections l ron hubbard's connections there are undeniable as you said mm -hmm. and he kind of wraps himself in this kind of quasi military uh, navy yeah, kind yeah, of stuff yeah. and we can get into all that but then the other part that i keep kind of dancing around i can't pin down is and you're not saying this, but I think it's a misstep that a lot of people take to say, oh, OK, then it's all fake. No, that doesn't mean that it's fake. It doesn't mean that they were not attempting to or successfully connecting with spirits, for lack of a better term, in this extended realm that are becoming their partners in engaging in this and have some ability to influence world events and things down well, here you, or you definitely to influence calling... people. Th this to me relates to the egregore thing that I'm always struggling with. Mm -hmm. It's L. Ron Hubbard is a huckster. Alistair Crowley is a huckster. Uh, there's They're a difference between them. Uh, the difference yes, between them yes, is but, Crow but Crowley on. took it seriously. Ron Hubbard didn't. That's the difference. Uh, that, no. No, that's not the difference. I promise you, man. No, the, the difference is that when you start messing with the extended realm, you inevitably, invariably don't know what the fuck you were doing. So the egregore thing, if we want to start writing books about it and putting it into, you know, fancy kind of words around it, we have to first and foremost acknowledge we have no idea how the fuck that extended consciousness realm works and whether performing ritual sex magic rituals works, quote unquote, or doesn't work or is more effective than L. Ron Hubbard getting in there and just partnering up with the CIA and breaking into the IRS and stealing documents. So, um, look, Ron Hubbard from the get go was a swindler. He was uh, working for the Alphabet Soup agencies and uh, he built up Scientology based on actually not based on OTO material. He didn't have much OTO material. He basically used Rosicrucian material from uh, Golden Dawn and from Armork. Now, uh, not just that, but the occult elements in his stuff was from there, uh, like some of the techniques. Uh, the philosophy was bullshit. I mean, it was low level, bad quality science fiction that he probably came up with himself. I mean, it's not that creative. I've never seen one example of uh, Hubbard uh, taking this seriously. At least he, he can show it in writing or he can show it in having studied, being a committed member of something, a student of something like Crowley have. Crowley has written a lot of stuff and been a committed student of something. They are the same in that they use their ego 
to like dominate uh, their surroundings a con man call them what you want but i promise you ron hubbard didn't take this stuff seriously when he was when he went to bed he was just a normal con man crowley was more of a metaphysical spiritual psychopath that's the difference in my view as for jack per past persons he was <laughs> a sincere uh, operator in this now you're saying we can't know when we mess around well yes or no it's too big for any single human being to you know know everything that's going on but we have tradition tradition is the accumulated knowledge of every human being on earth so um, in every field of society we are standing on shoulders the same comes to the metaphysical stuff so there are certain things we know about the metaphysical when i say we i don't mean google or uh, whatever but i mean there are accumulated knowledge among human beings about cosmos about the laws and principles ruling cosmos and um, this is being applied now the sex magic thing is a you is a small 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 segment within this huge world it's a small segment and not many people are are seriously doing it but it gets the attention because it's sensational it it's like it it, it sucks up the air in the room and and people only go for the extreme stuff so it's not important in human history same as satan as we discussed this right when i had you on for evil so it's not a big thing in human history but it it gets a lot of attention and so um yeah you can manipulate egregores you can create egregores you can work with it deliberately uh, especially when you are a person like crowley you want to reply to this no did, I, did I address your point or did i, I misunderstand uh, yeah. <laughs> move on move on okay. next okay, next from your so, list for, next yeah, from your shows you have the viking show is is uh, noteworthy and then i finally got randall carlson on when the earth nearly died and then i have who is number one which is people are wondering about that one what's going on it even got 11 votes not to being released yet <laughs> it's crazy but this is going to be about some of the cultural underlyings of Forum Borealis. And then we come to a show I want to discuss, Fourth Reich Endgame. I want to put this out as one of my favorites. Why? Because first off, I think it's the first time I have Joseph Farrell back since, I think the last time I was 19. I don't think I had him on for 20. I'm, I'm not sure I should check that. But at least it's a long time since I had him back. And we wrapped up a very important thread that we've been working on, the thing that many people associate him to. And um, it was all, all over a, a pretty good show. Uh, it's going to get some great post rants from me uh, when part two is finished. But part two is already out there for my subscribers in terms of the, show, uh, the interview itself. It just lacks the post commentary. But yeah, this is one of my favorites from, um, but you didn't listen to that, right? Because you didn't figure out how to, to open it. I've no, but I've listened to a bunch of the, you know, I, I don't have a lot of patience for the Joseph Farrell thing. I, I love yeah, I in the pat in the past, what he said about the fourth Reich end game. And I'm super interested in listening to it. But to me, and you know, this, my hang up is you can't totally miss the mark on UFOs and say that it's, you know, Nazi technology with little midgets in there. I mean, it's just so flat earthy kind of thing that then it <laughs> kind of destroys your credibility. Did you listen to the stuff. show I did with him on UFOs called The Spider I, I, in Roswell? I, I did. And what I hear is like kind of a reluctant backtracking from Farrell, you know, to get away from what he's saying, but never wanting to fully get away from it and say, oops, of course I was wrong. Of course that's doesn't make any sense and no, that's projection uh, you know he stands look it says you can't criticize graham hancock for suggesting that some of the alien ufo stuff is metaphysical you can't criticize uh, richard dolan for saying that some of it is 
creatures that are not human beings but are physical. You can't criticize Michael Schratt for saying that some of it is classified uh, technology. Look, it's you know this. It's a huge field. And then we have our friend, uh, our mutual uh, guest on who has his own spin. What's his name? We both had him on this year. Um, Nick Cook? Yeah, and his take on it, right? So it's just uh, puzzle pieces that adds to the whole picture. And Pharrell's lane is the Nazi angle and the deep state angle. That's just his lane. There's no reason for him to do what Dolan does, because Dolan and many other people already do it, and they do it so brilliantly. Peter Levenda tried to get into that uh, lane, but no, Pharrell, uh, Pharrell's lane is, is completely good, and uh, Pharrell and Hoagland both agree to a far extent about this. Like, for example, they are both open to the ancient civilization, uh, cousins being out there, that's one. And they're also open to potentially non terrestrial sources for this, be that other planets, dimensions, time time travel, etc. So that it's all in their lore, and you'll see it also in their writings. So uh, his book, Roswell and der Reich, he was just arguing that some specific UFO cases, especially around the end of the Second World War, has been uh, uh, up, basically, a psyop to make us look the other way. And I think that's completely fair. And I know you disagree with this, but but I have to say it for the listeners so they they don't misinterpret what your take on on Pharrell's attitude is because it's not correct. I see how you can perceive it like that, but but that's not his message. Okay, so I, I kind of hijacked that. Why don't you tell us what you liked about that show in particular? Because it's really what you've done there is really terrific. Because I've picked picked up bits of the trail and the Borman thing, and I think it's totally spot on. And I think that he's contributing a lot in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, I'm just maybe going a little bit too skeptico on it. So tell us what you what you really are, are valuing most in that episode. Yeah. So when I get him back in the future, apart from doing some religious and spiritual topics, we're going to do economy. That's where he really shines. He's a brilliant genius on that. And that ties directly into the octopus, the Le, Cir Le Circle, the uh, Die Spinne, uh, Odessa, Bowman Brotherhood, the Anglo-American elite. It's tied. And what I love with this show is that it's the perfect segue to discuss economy because when we come into economy we come into contemporary times more than anything and uh, the rise of the the globalist corporatism and I especially love part two because first off I get to read to him something we call notes on the Bormann conspiracy which is a collaboration it's the only thing you do this all the time in skeptical you could oh you d used to do it you had a collaboration project with your listeners well i've done it once on this so they add points to the timeline and i got to read that entire timeline to joseph and he commented upon it that I, I really loved doing. And also we covered 9-11 with him because he has his own spin on many things. You already noticed the UFO thing. I could mention other things, but one of them is the 9-11. It's kind of similar to his JFK ta take. It's not either of the above, it's all of the above. And so for the first time, we got to cover that with him too. Um, so... Yeah, I think it's all, all around is a high quality Pharrell show for those who are into Pharrell. Those who aren't into Pharrell, I think they'll enjoy part two. I think part one is going to be a little boring for them because he's, he's, he, part one is very nerdy, particular historical factoids that if you're not already used to this narration, you may lose the big picture, but the big picture comes back in part two. So this is uh, one of my uh, uh, favorites for for this year, definitely. Great. We can great. move on to the next show. We don't have to uh, discuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but okay, but okay. I will move on. <laughs> okay. okay. In my in my own skeptico way, and you know, as people who have listened to our conversations before, you know, know that one of the real total joys for me in talking to you is that we can have these exchanges and uh, agree and at the same time disagree and see the settler and I call it a level three kind of conversation which you just we just don't get to and I think there's less and less of these things where of course we agree on the big picture of course we agree on the bigger picture now let's talk about this other part where we don't agree and that's what gets most interesting to me so that's the, right in that spirit the second clip that I would share with you from Skeptico is the interview I did with Mitch Horowitz. And I titled it, Who Inspires You, Satan or Jesus? And let me play you a clip from that. You know, there were times when I was doing Jack that I actually felt retarded, like yeah. really retarded. Oh, yeah. I mean, I brushed my teeth retarded. I rode bus retarded. Damn. In a weird way, I had to sort of just free myself up to believe that it was okay to be stupid or dumb to be a moron yeah to be moronical exactly to be a moron an imbecile yeah <laughs> but simple jack thought he was smart or rather didn't think he was retarded so he can't afford to play retarded being a smart actor playing a guy who ain't smart but thinks he is that's tricky hmm tricky it's like working with mercury it's high science man it's art form yeah you an artist hmm that's what we do right yeah yeah hats off for going there Especially no not academy is about that shit. That's of course Ben Stiller and Robert Downey Jr. from Tropic Thunder. And it's a clip that has become somewhat of a touchstone cultural icon because the full retard thing, which is part of the clip that we're going to get to in a minute. But I wanted to start with this long way around the barn clip on the first part because what he slips in there, Robert Downey Jr. does in a very interesting way, is the reference to the Academy, that being the Academy Awards, which in our case serves as a very good stand in for culture and our popular culture and what we think of it and how we process it. And if this intro is a long way around the barn, which I assure you it is, then you will have to stay with me for its link to today's guest, Mitch Horowitz, who is self-described historian of alternative spirituality and one of today's most literate voices of esoterica, mysticism, and the occult. And he also happens to be a Satanist. Now, I'm not hating on him because he's a Satanist. As a matter of fact, I like Mitch Horowitz. Well, at least I like him well enough, but I'm not sure I trust Mitch Horowitz. I'm not sure I believe Mitch Horowitz. And I guess my doubt stems from this character that we touched on a couple episodes back named Colonel Michael Aquino, who it turns out is somebody that Mitch identifies as one of his greatest sources of inspiration. In that same article, you're asked, who are some of your greatest inspirations? Mm -hmm. And you mention Satanist Michael Aquino. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mitch, come on, this guy is one of the worst of the worst, you know, pedophiles. Uh, no, that's, that's not true. But no, hold on. Hold on. If you, say, if you say it's not true, okay, I, I get it's, it. It's not my saying it. That's grotesquely inaccurate. He died recently. Uh, he had no involvement with pedophilia whatsoever. I'm surprised to hear you say that. Okay, back to Tropic Thunder. You're serious? You don't know. Everybody knows you never go full retard. What do you mean? Check it out. Dustin Hoffman, Ray Man, look retarded, act retarded, not retarded. Count two picks, cheated cards, autistic, show, sure. not retarded. You got Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump. Slow, yes, retarded, maybe, braces on his legs, but he charmed the pants off next to him and won a ping pong competition. That ain't retarded. And he was a goddamn war hero. Right. You know any retarded war heroes? You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. I love that clip on so many levels. And maybe now you get what I mean. I mean, I can trust you. Just don't go full retard on me. Don't ask me to believe that Michael Aquino is not a worst of the worst Satanist, sex abusing, probably murderer of children, probably pedophile kind of person. Just go read his history. 
it starts in 67 when he's in the Phoenix program, which we talked about on the last episode. But that's just the beginning. He's named in the MK Ultra program. He's named by people involved in the Franklin scandal in 82. In 85, there's satanic ritual abuse allegations at Fort Bragg. Again, Aquino is identified as being part of that. And then the real ones that everyone points to and everyone knows about is at the Presidio Child Development Center in San Francisco in 86. 60 victims came forward. These are all little kids, three to seven years old, and they describe being taken to Aquino's house with him and his wife. They describe the inside, the crazy, insane, all black, all red walls, the altar, the satanic altar. Kids don't make that up. The evidence was so overwhelming that the police immediately got a search warrant and searched his house. And what do they find? All sorts of videotapes, photographs, photo albums, all of it, as we're later told but never shown, is related to this child sexual abuse thing. Cut it off there and appreciate you listening to such a long clip. But here's how I think that relates to exactly what you're talking about. Especially this year for me, I've been more and more kind of dogmatic about this search for the truth and what our truth community should be, and how we have to apply our own peer review, scientific method kind of thing on folks. And it really turns a lot of people off. So if I say Joseph Farrell has said this and it's total bullshit and it's provably bullshit, and he hasn't reversed himself completely, he hasn't come out, I've had to come out and say, oh my God, I believe that, I was wrong, then he needs to be called out because you can't just do a Mitch Horowitz and not get the facts right. Mitch is wrong fundamentally about the history of Michael Aquino, Colonel Michael Aquino, which leads us in a bunch of different directions of what does that mean in terms of us living under the freedoms, quote unquote, that we live under by a military industrial complex that is knowingly partnering with somebody like Michael Aquino. What does that mean today in a COVID vax or die kind of thing or vax and die kind of thing? So a a lot to process there, but I'm really getting kind of my backup about the truth thing and about calling people in and around the truth community on being accountable for being for telling the truth. And that doesn't mean that I have the truth. It just means I'm willing to stick my neck out and say, if I'm fucking wrong, I want to correct it. I don't want to be telling something that isn't true. So fucking tell me, show me where I'm wrong, but don't march out, you know, your sacred cow and say, oh no, you know, it doesn't really matter. He's kind of right on this and shouldn't we all just get along (laughs) bullshit? Yeah, look, um, several things to address there. First off, I haven't listened to that show. I'm gonna. I didn't know you had a Setian on. Or maybe we should just call them Satanists rather than Satanists. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to listen to this show. going to be interesting to see how he um, deals with, with those. Um, uh, yeah, Alex uh, rebuttals there. But um, and, and I, I, I don't suppose you want to discuss Satanism or, or, or Aquina, Michael Aquina. I don't know too much about... Uh, those things anyway. I know about Temple of Set, of course, and Church of Satan. But here's the thing. You can't, you, you, you're you conflating. It's two completely different things. That's not what's going on here in terms of Joseph Farrell. First off, you got this notion about him that I, I'm trying patiently to correct. But if you think that notion is correct, then you need to, we need to start with a source. We can't start with your feeling, your interpretation, your vague impression of what Pharrell means or thinks or, say, or has said. You need to point to something specific. Address that in terms of making him accountable for it. And if I then actually agree with him, uh, I will uh, come to his defense rather than play the... Um, devil's advocate so when i'm correcting what i think is a erratic notion you have about uh, pharrell's take on ufos it's not because we all have to play along to get along it's not because 
I'm invested in his philosophy somehow. I'm not. <laughs> we just get along very well. Uh, it's actually because I think you're wrong. It's the same reason I'm defending uh, Levenda when you, uh, which is a completely fair of you to think that he somehow is connected to the alphabet soup. Fine, you think that. I disagree from the evidence I've seen. And I can argue f for it if if need be. And that's what I'm doing here with Pharrell. Pharrell, from the get-go, listen, I re re discovered him before most other people when he wasn't famous and I've listened to hours and hours he did of basically free rants because the interviewer she she just asked a question then then she shut up nothing like you and me right but I've listened to that so I know where he's coming from on these things and he's it's not like he started out saying all oh, UFOs are Nazis and then eventually uh, uh, some are but you know it may be that some UFO no 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 never did he uh, do anything like that? And I read his books, which is actually should be the source for where someone's coming from rather than <laughs> what we squeeze out of them, right, in a conversation. Because, you know, you and me, we can say stuff in, a co in the heat of a conversation that may not be like the main philosophy default baseline of what we're thinking. But... And like you say, actually, you say, look, we agree about the big stuff. So when we flush out disagreements like this, it's the small, meticulous things. And and that's where the fun is. And that's where we can learn and, and move on and get some dynamic. Right. So but it, but remember, we have a huge platform in common. So it's kind of what's going on here. Uh, Again, I just have to reiterate, he never said everything is Nazis and he's never backed off the Nazi thing. In fact, as more and more people pick this up, more and more evidence comes out. So it's never been as clear before as ever that, I mean, the Nazi thing is so huge that even conmen have taken it and run with it. Like, you, I don't know if you're aware of um, the... Uh, these are real con men, not, not like the two, the Stars Academy, who actually has something going for them. The um, David Wilcock and Corey, Corey Good. Good. Uh, he's just one of, of these swindlers. But yeah. Yeah, just, you know, I mean, just, oh man, it's very, very tricky territory. There's uh, No, no, it's so much. Uh, look, I've gone deep into that. It's so much that's flushed out. He is a con man, and he's also... Um, like most con men, he's also psychiatrically unstable. Um, he's just someone who lucked out uh, in order to... Because there's so many naive people in this. Look, I agree with what you said. One of the things you said, you said it's... Up, we in the... I hate the term, you using it, so I'm going to use it now. In the alternative field, in the counterculture field, in the independent media. It's incumbent upon us to flush out bullshit. Because there's so much bullshit there and it, it comes with the territory because most people who are open to that they are disillusioned with the huge main cult called society the propaganda in the mainstream whether it's mainstream academia mainstream media politics you name it right religion and so the problem is most people are not educated in order to find out how to you know source criticism distinguish so it's often like the, the less intellectual and academically trained you are the more it's more like a belief thing okay i don't believe these so now i'm opening myself up to the counter but the problem is the counterculture it is not a f soccer match where you have two equal teams and you have to like a tribalist choose one that's not what's going on it's one huge cult which <laughs> within itself has of course some differences and then there's everything else and in the everything else lane there can be put if some of them takes over we, we're in a new cult right so it doesn't mean everything else is is carte blanche so we have to be critical and picky and of course like it's an easy f low hanging fruit but you have the flat earth thing right we don't want that to take over as a as an extreme example so i agree with you buddy we need to clean up our own and that's when we you know discussions like the moon landing for example comes into play right you have uh, very different views there some uh, 
you and me would find kooky, so we would find more realistic. And you can, you know, go through the uh, everything that's suppressed, COVID, you name it. You know, you have uh, in the COVID thing, you also have those who deny that it's a thing. You had one on, I love that show, but that was 20, not 21. A guy who claimed it didn't exist, and you just flushed him out, like, beautifully, like no mainstreamer could have managed to do. <laughs> well, so... Yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? I do know what you're saying, and I think that you you made a really important point that I want to kind of pull out and highlight there, and that that's there's a certain tool set that goes with critical thinking, that goes with logical thinking, and it's related to the scientific method. I just had a guy the other day tell me, you know, the scientific method is bullshit. I, I've had a bunch of people tell me, you know, science is so corrupted now that, you know, forget it, forget, even forget the scientific method. And I full stop, full stop injection. I've had some of those on two. One of them, his name is Alex Sakiris. We had a heated <laughs> discussion for two hours. But go on. Well, it, I think in many ways, as we try and traverse this territory of the metaphysical and the physical, which we want to do, we want to have a, a kind of materialist consensus reality discussion. We're both on Zoom. We're talking into a microphone. You had salmon soup for lunch. Um, these are kind of things where we want to kind of ground ourselves and say th that's a common reality, you know. And then we have this metaphysical reality that are we living in a simulation? Is mm. all of the – are we just creating egregorically, topoly, you know, everything around us? And we want to exist in both those worlds. The point is the scientific method has some great tools for traversing the physical the it's the world is out there and i can measure it so wink nod the world isn't really out there and you can't really measure it but let's pretend the world is out there and you can measure it and what you're pointing out is that there's a certain tool set that goes with that and you, yes. you, we might want to avail ourselves of that tool set and i also agree with you just wholeheartedly about this process and cleaning up our own and being accountable and holding ourselves to a standard. And with that, you know, then I'm really okay with moving beyond uh, Joseph Farrell, but I'm also big on, you know, kind of pushing people and aggravating people, which I've done. It's, it's like, I got friends in the podcasting world that have been around for a long time. So, you know, if you're gonna have Damien Eccles on your show, then you at least ought to ask him <laughs> if he raped and murdered those kids yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. all his other co-conspirators admitted that he raped and murdered those kids. And he was convicted by two juries of doing that. And he was never exonerated. So if you're going to have him on your fucking show, just ask him and then we can mm. move on. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I talked to other people. I talked to Miguel. I like Miguel. Miguel had him on. And Miguel said, yeah, I understand that. I under That's what? legitimate. N Miguel had this Eccles guy on? Yes. And and that's oh, okay. Wow. That's that's okay. I didn't it, know he, he still lived, even. I thought oh, he was yes. dead or oh, no, in prison. Oh, no, no, no. He's writing books. He's, you know, uh, friends with uh, all Why the don't you people. have him on, then? Why don't you have him on? I, I I guess I would I would have him on. There's a line there that gets to promoting something. With, I, I mm -hmm. the line for me is if Damian Eccles showed up at my doorstep and said, "Hey, I I, I want to be on. I want to I want to come on and you know <laughs> respond to what you're saying uh, he, in a second. In a okay. second, but, I but would the old him. Alex, the old Alex, he would totally have James Randi on without respecting the guy. I did have James Randi on, and I had a lot of other people on, and that's a good distinction. That's more for if we ever do that show on the whole journey. And the 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 distinction there, it, for me, is the evil distinction. You know, it's oh my what God. people. You can you can argue that James Randi is evil. He's done so much damage. Yes. And he, he may even have, have um, done stuff to kids, too. As you oh, know. yes. Yes. I did not know that. I did not know that at the time. And I would have asked him. And, you know, I was too soft on James Randi uh, mm. at the time because 
you know, we Maybe change. Early we, on. we don't yeah. know. Yeah. But I mean, I, I asked them some hard questions. I just didn't really push hard enough. I guess to, to wind that back, I was just really kind of agreeing with you on, you know, the methods that we must have for yeah. re, recalibrating our methods for finding the truth. So it was a kind of long, long way around the barn. Whose turn is it now? Is it your turn to go next? Uh, I, think I just it is. realized uh, how we're doing this. I thought we were going to do three of mine and then three of yours, but uh, it's one um, mine and one yours, right? That's what's going on here. So that, that is, is what, my turn. Yeah. Yes. That, that is my turn. Okay. So, uh, and that's, uh, I, I will, I think after this recording, I, I think I will manage to get two shows out before the end of the year, which are not there yet. Um, but the last show that is there now is The Secret of Secrets, How to Survive Death. You know what? Maybe, can I do what you did? Play? But this notion of the body of light part is the key. Yeah. A lot of these groups just don't have that information no they don't and basically everything we ha we do has to do with preparing for death and the most powerful ritual i've ever experienced in my life and i've been in a lot of ritual uh, i visited all the groups tibetans you name it and i was present at uh, i've been so lucky as to be present at the death ritual where they mm -hmm. where there was when we initiate who had died this death ritual is kind of uh, connect with uh, uh, gregora and help the dying it is creating a i mean i'm not giving details so i can talk about this in general sure. creating a I think a portal, like a, a kind of a, creating some kind of energy without going into details, and then invoke the brother or sister who's recently departed and bind them into the center of the place where this is taking place. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, what you call it, when you get some extra thrust, kind of throw them into their the path uh, further. So create this energy ritually invoke the person and then guide that person further into the the other world and okay. it's all done with lots of tools like sound is being made chanting uh, recitations actions uh, it's the most powerful uh, like I, I, I was there with another from Norway and he was in tears it was annoying actually because snot and every I had to hold his hand right and he got <laughs> snot on it and everything so but okay <laughs> but that's how powerful it, I was just blown out of my socks okay. and and I realized oh my god man it's all about it's all about the death process so what you heard here Alex <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna point out a show called The Secret of Secrets, but I was teasing it with uh, playing something a quote from the end of another show with the same guy, uh, hacking aggregates that we discussed earlier. The reason is that I think this sums up what this other show was all about, and people think it's hyperbole, and the thing is. Um, I really do. I, I should do more. Or I think you pronounce it hyper, hyperbole. I think I should Hi do more. Hyperbola, we say, but everyone gets what you're talking about. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It should be hyperbole. But the thing is, I should do more hyperbole in my titles and stuff. Because I, I usually go for poetic titles instead of to the point or even teasers. But in this show, people would think it's a uh, hyperbole, secret of secrets. But it's not. It's what it's actually called. Arcana Arcanorum, the secret of secretorum. It's actually what it's called. That's how big of a secret it is. And I think I, I, I'm the first show ever uh, disclosing some of these. Of course, we're scratching the surface. Of course, both me and the guest know tons more than what's coming out in, in the discussion. But at least we're having that discussion in the open. And I think this is one of my most important shows. I think it's only surpassed. You know, when you say what's important, the, so many filters or criteria you can re work from, right? But if we uh, narrow it down to spirituality and metaphysics and esoterics, and if we also narrow it down to usefulness, exclusiveness, info you won't get many places, then I say the only show I've done that's 
can surpass this is one of the, my least popular shows. And that just confirms, like I said with Cliff High, when I had him on, uh, you know, we rated the shows we did together. And we all agreed that the most popular is going to be the least important. <laughs> this is that was the Antarctica show. And the least popular I did with him was the most important, which was the death show. Now, the same here, right? So with um, uh, a guy called Timothy Hogan, I did the most important and least popular show, which was about the elements, a two-parter. But apart from that one, I think this is the most important and exclusive in terms of any, uh, information. Uh, so it's basically releaking some universal secrets, if that's even a word. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of the word of the term public secrets. It's kind of similar. It's like you have people all over the world who knows about this from time immemorial, but they've all kept it under wraps. And uh, yeah, say no more. It's all about death, man. Which actually dovetails with the with, uh, aims of Skeptico. Skeptico has a huge focus on death too, only from a completely different angle. No, that's perfect. Because one of the questions I was going to ask you relates directly to that. I think the uh, occult, the hidden, the esoteric, I, I, I'm, I'm super interested in the wisdom there because I think there is wisdom there but you're right I have intentionally kind of done an end run on it and my end run on death is near-death experience and reincarnation science because again we can kind of pin it down so we've talked about that a bunch in the past but yep. I guess what I'd ask you as it relates to that really wonderful clip that you played is to what extent is it secret? Is it hidden when we now have thousands of people who've crossed that barrier and have found a way to come back and tell us about it? And then ah. part two of that question is, what do we do with the implications for technology there? Because it's clear that more people are quote unquote coming back, I hate that term, but that's what we have to use. Mm -hmm because of our advanced medical technology having to do with resuscitation. So we can actually blur that line in a way that we couldn't. And why is it that this extended consciousness is blurring the line with us as we do that? What are your thoughts? Excellent uh, point you're raising here. I will answer it like this. And what I'm saying now, I, I never have said before, I think. So this is very important. If anyone give any credence to my inputs, open and sharpen your ears, folks. In esoterica, there are two layers. You have what people think of when they hear the word. I won't even discuss occultism because that's big. That's like the lowest. That's like the crap. That's like the pulp fiction, the pulp fact of esoterica. So I won't even go. That's where you find Damien Angles and stuff like that. But in serious esoterica, people who are into it as a path in their life, there are two layers. There is the one that you will Google, where you will find books from Levelin, for example, or Aquarius or wooden books or. Uh, organizations you've heard about um, everything from semi esoteric like yeah like Marx own uh, Institute of Hermetic Studies to more downright uh, initiatory systems like for example the Rosicrucian order or Mark now all this is really exoterica it's esoterica in exoterica so if you can Google something if you can join something, if you can just apply online for something, it's not really esoteric. Remember, folks, it's correct when Alex says occultism means the hidden. But esoterica really means it. it Pythagoras coined that term. Uh, no, I, I, oh, I said Aristoteles. I forgot. But it was, I think it was Aristoteles who coined the term. But it was describing the initiates of the ancient mystery schools, of the ancient mystery traditions. It was that which is never in the public. So it is that which you are initiated into, whether it's physically done by like a group or a ritual or whatever, or 
the real initiations, which are spiritual, where you access a level of realization and an understanding that is completely subjective, that you cannot share in the objective world. It's like what Taoism says. The truth that can be spoken is not the real truth. The secret that can be revealed is not the real secret. So that brings us to the second layer, which the less we say about it, the better. But there is a, a very small, very small, um, I say, a, 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 what's the word? Like just a, a, not a fragment, but a segment. There's a small segment of esoteric are still around. It used to be the thing, now it's just fragments. And within those circles, yeah, you can Google it, you can find it online, you can find it in books. And that's where the real secrets are. And so these people, let's call them um, gods of mystery, tradition gods or whatever, are preserving something from the dawn of mankind and there are tools, there are structures, there are methods, there are insights, there's lore. And the difference between, say, an initiate like Parmenides in ancient Greek, who went into the other world and came back and brought something with him to share with us, the difference between him and some random Jude who a car runs over and then he's being resuscitated by Bruce Grayson, is that both of them are having real experiences. But when you are just a random person who stumbles into the metaphysical, you have two problems. It's the same with the UFO thing. If you're exposed to it, this is Jacques Vallée's really big point, if you're exposed to the UFO phenomenon, you have no apparatus to deal with it. So you will... It's, it, it goes for anything. It, it, police knows this too, that witnesses, re, really the psychology of the witness is more important than what they actually experienced in terms of making sense of. This is the same in the satanic panic or in children who have fantasy. You know, how can we distinguish between false memory and real? And this is the same, the UFO phenomenon, you're not equipped to deal with whatever phenomenon is manifesting there. So you think it's Virgin Mary or you think it's... It's a spaceship from uh, Alpha Centauri. It all depends on what you already have in your mind in order to how you can interpret that. The same with the ant when he encounters your foot, right? So this is what I'm saying also about the other world. Someone who's trained, who has devoted his life or her life to this and deliberately triggers this experience. It's a completely different ball game than some poor sucker who just ends up there and then is being brought back. I'm not saying it's invalid or no value from what that other person, but that's where you get people like the guy you had on the show who said, it's all about Jesus, man. Oh, if it wasn't Jesus, then it's bullshit, right? That's his filter. So, yes, there's useful, especially if there's commonalities across time and culture, for, for these kinds of researching. Then you can find objective factors, but... It's, it's like the difference between a primary school and university when you regard the initiates and their death experience and the random John Doe or Jane Doe. You see what I'm saying? I do see what you're saying. And I think it's, I think it's an interesting point. I would, if we were really going to dive into it, I'd ask you to back it up because, you know, my entry or my continued interest in near-death experience is about the science and as close as we can come to the science and we already get i already gave the speech that you know science isn't perfect and it's you know by definition it's wrong because it suggests that the world is out there and the world is measurable and we know that it isn't but i would turn that around and say everything that you just said is kind of dependent on some kind of consensus reality. So the clip I would play kind of in response to that is from an interview from May of this year that I did with Dr. Jeff Long, the near-death experience researcher. I'll play the clip and then we can chat about it. Let's have everybody think of one incident where Katniss Everdeen genuinely moved you. When she volunteered for her sister at the reaping. 
Excellent example. Good. What else? Oh, when she sang that song for Little Rue. Oh, yeah. We didn't get choked up at that. Mm. You know, I like you better, Effie, without all that makeup. Oh, I like you better sober. That's, of course, Woody Harrelson from The Hunger Games, a clip that would seem to be, because it is, a long way around the barn from an interview with one of the world's leading near-death experience researchers, Dr. Jeff Long, who's compiled the largest searchable database of near-death experiences, and who joined me primarily because I wanted to verify, because I reference it so many times, the quality of the data in the database. Here's a short clip. Are you in any way scrubbing the database? Are you in any way taking out any references that might be offensive to someone? You know, if it's if they're satanic, you know, or this and that, or I, I, I don't think so, because I even do N-D-E-R-F aliens. I do N-D-E-R-F E-T. There are a few entries that come up. It doesn't seem to me like you're in there scrubbing the database in this kind of cancel culture, shadow banning, you know, we don't know what's really out there. Uh, great question, Alex. The only change that we make to the entirety of what is shared with us is we remove references. I mean, they may dislike their doctor that they believe was involved in their life-threatening event. So we remove names just to preserve confidentiality. Our overriding concern is the confidentiality of who shares. We post everything that they share with us. It would be an abomination to us to pull out anything that we didn't like or we disagreed with. If they share it with us, it goes up. The real point that I'd like you to respond to about Jeff Long is uh, we're trying to do what we can do to get at a data set. So yeah. I, I kind of resist the notion that, oh, you know, I, I'm doing my best there to say, yep. is there anything wrong with this data set? How would we evaluate this data set, which should match your data set, right? I mean, this is the way that we would investigate yes. this. Yes. And it's interesting because science is doing the same as Esoterica did. See, Esoterica has known all the time that everything you encounter in what you call extended realm is dependent on filters. Those filters would be obviously cultural, lingual, linguistic, religious in the term of like what kind of set of symbols and, and, and notions do you operate in spiritually. Um, so there's a uh, psychological, of course, even gender. So, and, and that's what uh, near-death science also I see. They see, hmm, there are some things that are commonalities and there are some things that are subjective. It doesn't mean the subjective thing is wrong or unreal. It just means some things need to go through your filter. If you hear, if you hear a political speech, let's say Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or something, Ron Paul, your filter is going to determine what you're taking out of that. Someone who's a supporter of one of those would be, ah, wow, woo, great stuff, man. Another one would be, ah, well, fuck him. Ah. You see what I mean? They're all exposed to the same objective vibrations. They hear the same. Everything, they're at the same event, taking place at the same time, but they're taking different things with them. And that's the same going. That's why Taoism is one path. And Toltec is another esoteric path. That's why Vairajana is one path, and uh, let's say uh, Gnosticism another. So you can't just do everything. You can't ride a million horses at the same time. My point is, find a horse that actually brings you there. And if you find such a, well, let's bet, do a better uh, analogy. It's all about the mountain. Let's go to the traditional mountain. Most people, new agers and, you know, flirting with stuff, they are just dancing around the mountain. Oh, let me try this path. I'm going a couple of meters up there and I, I, I want to try another one. And they go down again and they never commit to a path, so they never get anywhere. Oh, I know everything about what's going on because I've been around the mountain five times. I can tell you a million entrances to the mountain, but they really can't tell you much apart from that superficial level. Now, someone who actually determines to go to the top of the mountain and when he reaches the top, by the way, he, the, the, he's past the clouds so he can see the sun shining bright. Now, the higher up he, gone, he comes, the more these different paths would dwindle into 
one path. Eventually, you come as high that there's only four paths, east, north, west, south. And the higher up you come, the more you can actually not know just your own path. I'm so high up the mountain that I can see other parallel paths. I can't see the path on the opposite side. If I'm from the south, I can't see the north path, but I can definitely see some path to the left and some to the right of me. And I can even advise some people who are not on my path, but on that path. Oh, careful where you're threading. Uh, you may fall down. Oh, there's a, there's a hill there where you can find some food. So the higher up I, I come, the more I can survey all the other paths too. And only when I'm at the top of the mountain, I can see all paths. This is how you should understand the spiritual traditions in the world. And this is what they are reinventing with science as near-death experience and, and reincarnation. They're trying to get data points that's valid to all. And they're trying to also find what's commonalities and what's dependent on uh, individual factors. And last thing I want to say about this is remember who created science. Esoteric minded people created science. Uh, they don't teach you that anymore in, uh, for example, the history of science or philosophy of science. They will only mention quirky, weird factories when you if you're at a deep enough level, yeah, Isaac Newton was into alchemy and astrology for some weird reason. Ah, Francis Bacon was flirting with this or that for some reason. But the fact of the matter is that up until science was hijacked uh, in the 1800s by materialists, they, but they, they didn't just hijack it overnight. It was a long battle, but eventually they won. They won over the Royal Society and different uh, other scientific vehicles and outlooks and then it became full materialist and everything was purged but why did esoteric initiates create the scientific method and even scientific institutions and all that stuff because they knew this is the only way we can educate the masses the masses will never be enlightened people they will never be interested in these things that me and alex are interested in and trying to find the big questions or oh, may never say never but certainly not back in the day they didn't have the tools for it or the education so the best way to do this is to bring enlightenment. That was the whole idea, for example, of Rosicrucianism. We're going to enlighten the Reformation, the Renaissance, uh, the Enlightenment. All that stuff was brought about by the, the enemies of the then ruling order, which was uh, for a long time Catholicism or Islam for that matter, although Islam was more open to, to enlightenment in certain periods of, of their, especially in the Ottoman Empire, and eventually also materialism that succeeded uh, the, this spiritual hegemony. So esoterics created it because they've been into science all the time. They've been into spiritual science. And as our tools better, there was always physical science too. Like in the ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, you couldn't distinguish between spirituality and science. It was the same thing. A mystery priest was also the one who actually measured a map or developed chemistry for this or that, conserving the mummies or how, uh, when should we harvest or how should we navigate the seas. It was all, yeah, it was practical applications of spiritual reality. So those things were, went hand in hand. Dualism came, materialism came, and somehow science got rubbed out of this truth realm consciousness realm and now it's come full circle because now we see and this goes back to this is a call back to what we started discussing today Alex and that's that science has come full circle now to become a tool for lie misinformation deception illusion and that's why why we need to clean up we need to be truth committed and you don't you have to be fact committed in hard sciences today natural sciences but you don't have to be truth committed and we see this even in health science. It's all about money, propaganda, power, politics, and science, science, <laughs> truth, and even facts matter less now. So that's the problem when you remove the spiritual layers of science and you put it into the hands of, of uh, materialism and opportunists, is better to say. I mean, it's all about power and control. I, I really appreciate what you're saying. I don't hear many people talking about this. And that's what's, oh, it's just, I just get charged up talking to you because 
this is so special to have that kind of conversation. And I love your analogy. I love your analogy of climbing the mountain and the trail backs and, you know, but I, I'm, I'm, Skeptico. I mean, I've grown into being skeptical. Maybe I always was, but I'm inquiry to perpetuate doubt. So my mind always goes to the counter example. And I think sometimes that turns people off. But again, it doesn't turn you off, which is wonderful, because to me, the counter example of what you're saying is, you know, I've been a yogi for a long time. And people misunderstand that if you say you're a yogi, then you're a yogi, you don't have to have, you don't have to show the the certificate you got from the weekend retreat that you did, <laughs> that right. doesn't matter. All you have to do is say, I'm a yogi, and then you're a yogi. But I've been, you know, a lot of different schools, a lot of different teachers, a lot of different learnings. I particularly remember being in San Diego when I had moved out here, and where I live is kind of a really fascinating part of yoga in the West, because I live in North San Diego County, which was kind of the landing point for a guy named Patabi Joyce. And Patabi Joyce was really, along with BKS Iyengar, the two people who are most responsible for bringing the kind of physical yoga, you know, the kind that you can go down in the gym and do and all that. And they were uh, disciples of Krishnamacharya, who said, go send this, spread this to the West, and they did. And I actually studied under a teacher who was BKS Iyengar teacher and actually brought BKS Iyengar over. And then I studied wow. under a teacher here in San Diego who actually brought Patabi Joyce over. So I just kind of casually met both those people. Patabi Joyce, it turns out, was sexually abusing his students, which I later found out in my <laughs> interview with my yogi friend who was sold into sex slavery oh, yeah. to a satanic cult Danica. when she was six years old, but she was also sexually abused by Patabi Joyce. I, of course, checked that because you don't want to just take somebody's word no. for that. And there are now hundreds of women who've come forward and said that Patabi Joyce wasn't exactly on point with where he was doing that energy. But back to my long story, I remember being in this class with this wonderful Brazilian woman who was our yoga teacher, and we had really vibed and were sinking and talked, but she had made some point about respecting this tradition of, of the Indian tradition where, I, where this comes from. And I was like in my iconoclastic kind of skeptical way, say, bullshit on that. You know, for all their, their beautiful, wonderful insights, they're still marrying their daughters off at 11 years old. They still have a, a culture that classifies people into these different cults that they can't get out of and these classifications and untouchability is still a real fucking thing. So yes. don't tell me about the flowers from this wonderful spiritually oriented, which everyone says, you know, right. India is the source of all this. Fuck that have shit. Have you been there? Have you been no, there? No, I haven't I have. been there. I have. But it, it, great. Good for you. But my point is, I like fucking Jeff Long from Iowa, who's collecting <laughs> 3,000 accounts from Andy ears that I can search. I like Gregory Shushan from ex from Oxford, who's studying cross culture NDEs across time. So 600 years of NDEs across times from across a bunch of different cultures: Western Plains Indians, uh, people down on the Mesa in Mexico, as well as people in Africa and on the islands and all the rest of that shit. And I say bravo to that. And if that science mm. lines up. With what you're saying, then I say bravo. And if it doesn't, I say you bring forth the evidence to show me where they're wrong. Show me where there okay. needs to be the course correction. And I'm down with it. I, I Let me go back to where I started because I get in on a rant and it sounds like I'm against what you're saying. I'm not no, no. against what you're saying. Yeah, I yeah. think what you're saying is a beautiful, beautiful piece of the puzzle, but it's a clay pot that needs to be tested through the most severe sure. heat that we can apply to it. And the beauty of Bring what Western science has done now is it's brought us some new data points that we cannot just dismiss as, well, that single mom from Iowa who said that, you know, she saw Jesus, we can just dismiss her account because she wasn't, 
she wasn't esoteric enough. Fuck that shit. Right. I don't. I don't buy that. No. I mean, maybe maybe we should, but I, I don't no. know. No, we shouldn't. I I I just said uh, a random person who look a random person who takes an LSD trip and doesn't even know he's on LSD. Will still there will still be valuable lessons from his experience versus the old hippie who who trips once a week, right? Now let me address some of these excellent points you made. I said there was two layers, and the same isn't just true for Western esoterica; it's true for all esoterica. So, Alex, when a long-haired Indian comes to California and sell and, and, and accumulates a group of young beautiful women and exclusive cars and all that stuff he you already know what layer he's operating on it's the same way you can go to a golden dawn group and the, in fact this happened to uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine his uh, girlfriend was being initiated into a golden dawn group and he wasn't there but uh, the friends were and this she was so it, 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 and of course this is a fake golden dawn is like the outer layer so it's like they rely instead of on real spiritual triggers they really rely on hypnotic effects and all, all that stuff so it's more like a theater esoterica but so she was then so is psychologically vulnerable because of her mind was blown and all that stuff because of their hypnotic elements so he screwed her had sex with her the same evening which is a huge it's it's the same as your psychologist doing it or your professor or something you know what i mean it's such a betrayal so that per, so yeah that happens all the time and whether it's Indians or in West, look, if Jeffrey Long that you mentioned, not to pick on him, he's probably an excellent person, but he's done good research in this field. We can agree about that, right? Now, let's say it leaks out that he was abusing an intern. Does that invalidate all the work he did? No. You just have to understand that we're talking about human beings, the human limitations. This is why there's, you have to uh, realize that there's two standards. So the real Indian guru won't come to your doorstep in, in Godam, uh, San Diego. You have to f fucking climb a mountain in Himalaya to come to his doorstep. That's how it works. That's why I'm saying this second layer of esoterica is very exclusive and it annoys people to no end. In fact, it annoys people so much that many, some, I, I don't believe it exists because I can't get access. Oh, it's probably just conceited uh, elitists. Uh, why can't they share it with me? I can't Google it. I can't uh, attain it. So it's probably bullshit. And others are more like romantic notion. Oh, it's probably G people. Those people are probably at the level of Buddha and Jesus and I better kiss their feet and they're probably telepathic. No, 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 and no. It's a human experience. There's human limitations. But uh, I'll explain it like this, Alex. If I was so lucky to be a guardian of a wisdom tradition, and I knew you, Alex, very well, and I knew that you're an ethical person, I knew you were a responsible person, I knew you were a sincere seeker, I knew you had an intellectual apparatus for it, I would totally uh, open a door for you to see if you went through it so that you could be, become an initiate. But that's how it works. That's how it's been working since day one. You don't just sell, go to the town square and announce, that's what the con men do. And that's how 99% of people are being swapped up by people like that, a Crowley or whatever. But the real, but what they are faking, the illusions they are playing out, what they are pointing to exists, but on a different level. So they are taking the real thing that they themselves don't have access to because they can never qualify to, to get there. And they are making a muck version, a con man, a commercial version of that where they can gather all the, you know, some of the stuff they are, they, they, this guru is saying you may find in some exclusive ashram maybe. So I'm not saying mm, there's no commonalities, but I'm saying those who actually practice, walk as they talk, they do it solely because they have learned how to God. And if one of these con men actually managed to, to get access to one of these small ancient groups, that group will be corrupted and it will be destroyed. And that's what has happened for thousands of years. That's why there's so few around. Only those around, whether it's 
individuals or networks or even organizations are around because they have learned how to guard themselves from the human uh, limitations and if they don't if they go wrong if if they are like brilliant people and we are all faulty and 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 the mistake is big enough it's tonk it's sank you, you it's gone so um <laughs> it just shows how important it is to so it depends on your standard most people are content with going around the foot of the mountain and smell a bush and walk a couple of feet and then go back and try something else most people have no commitment to go and come to the top of the mountain but i'm telling you the more you climb whatever tools you use whether and and science should be one of the tools psychology too philosophy, religion, you name it, whatever human knowledge, insight, experience to stand on other people's sho shoulders rather than reinventing the wheel, the further up you will go and the harder it becomes, the harder the tests, the more you have to refine yourself. You cannot get to the top of the mountain and pass the confusing clouds and just be bombarded by the radiation of the sun without refining yourself you have to your ethics your wisdom the so your, your how you 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 said one thing you said uh, we have to be trained to critical thinking that's a part of it too and so if you're just talking science there are certain uh, qualifiers that you need to achieve there but if you're talking science of life if you if you're not distinguishing out just a segment of life but you're talking about a path in existence in life then it, it has to be all the human layers has to be refined as you uh, develop. And that means your sensory, uh, your, your body in terms of health, your, your, your perception, the way you're sensing things, your feelings, the way your, your emotions work, your psychology, the way you're uh, thinking and, and reasoning and thoughts uh, work, and your creativity. Uh, your, your ability to go into the transcendental all of that stuff has to be refined simultaneously all the time and it's damn hard man that's why you could probably count on a couple of hands how many people really <laughs> reached the top at least that we can remember today but I'm saying the less known a guru is the more believable he is granted that he he is not just less known because he hasn't started out. I'm not talking Ron Al, Al Ron Herbert before he published stuff. He was always a crook. I'm talking about someone who's been in operation and nobody knows him. Go to that guy. He'll teach you much more than the guy you can Google. You, you, you catch my drift here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot there I agree with. But we have to we have to kind of wrap this thing up a little bit. And I think the best way to do that is with this predictions thing. So... Maybe limit it to one or sneak two in there, but what are your bestest predictions for 2022? So I have a two and a half prediction. Number one, I think Omicron may be God sent, metaphorically speaking, because it achieves what none of the vaccines ever even try to achieve, which is bringing about herd immunity. Because as it looks now, uh, Dr. Malone, who invented the RMNR technology, listened to his interview on the Jimmy Dore show. He tells you explicitly, you should never ever, and everybody knows this, who, but it's not scientists who's running this show. It's, it's political agenda and, and big pharma. But you should never ever vaccinate during a pandemic apart from the very vulnerable and, and, and sick should wait until after when it becomes endemic like the flu now one of the reasons you shouldn't do that just one and we don't have time to go into this full hour, is that you are preventing the herd immunity but here's the thing we now know from research that the best immunity is as it's always been it's nothing new what we learned in basic school is natural immunity combined with this that Probably, that's probably why it originated in Africa, because in Africa they are no, almost not vac vaccinated. So there Omicron allegedly comes from, and 
it has managed to get to where Dr. Malone said, namely being very, very infectious, even more than the gain of function research result of original COVID-19. And so it's very, very infectious, but it's much less uh, severe. And that means that and when people get it, they will be immune to future strains and past strains, unlike, the, again, the vaccine. So this is, my prediction is that if they're right, that it is milder and but more infectious, it may just be the thing that pushes people's collective paradigm over the top so they realize, oh my God, this is endemic, not pandemic. We have to li learn to live with it. Everybody will get COVID sooner or later, which means that we should deal with it as Norway did recently and classified it at the same level of the cold and the, inf and the influenza. And that means we cannot shut down society anymore because of that. And so when people then, even if it comes a harder COVID strain, the Omicron has made sure you're immune. That's my first prediction. My second is, I said two and a half, that's because the second can go two ways. So this either what will happen is that people will get so fed up with this uh, fascism that's taking place now that they will rise up against it. But we may need a little more time if we have uh, more time, because on the here's the other prediction, and that's that they will nail the um, evolution, the development of things in the direction they're pushing it, meaning bye bye forever to basic freedoms and civil society and, you know, a complete takeover of all channels of media and communication, complete censorship, complete corporatism. And, and it, unfortunately, as so often, uh, if not always, it's so dependent on America, on the USA, which we, the rest of the world hates because we have to wait for that dumbed down, broken down, just crushed uh, population to to somehow manage to rise and the only outlets you have to rise up see it seems is to become more and more extremism extremist in um kind of a pseudo fascistic like there's two kinds of fascism playing out playing out in america there's the top down fascism which is the real fascism which is the corporatism the elites and then there's the bottom up fascism which kind of is a react it's a reactionary thing to that but it's the only lane people have to go and and even that is ta being taken away from them because it's being used in a, as an excuse to smack down all sorts of political um, um, dissidents so it's going to go either further in that direction or the reaction from the people will manage to 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 kick back but i'm becoming more and more pessimistic look at australia man oh my god so that's my predictions and unfortunately both were related to covid <laughs> you know i was about what to about say you? i thought we were going to get through this whole thing without doing the covid thing but i guess it's inevitable particularly when Mention you're doing it is allowed. Uh, you're right i mean you can't <laughs> talk about predictions for 2022 and not you know talk about it. so what i'll do for my prediction is play a clip first and this is an oldie but if people remember this from their truth seeking library in their head oh man go go revisit this on so many levels but it's an interview that was done by alex jones and i sometimes can get frustrated with alex jones but when i do i go back and listen to interviews like this and I remember that he has given us so, so much. So I don't know if he's co-opted. I don't know anything like that. But this is so uniquely wonderful and important. It's an interview with Aaron Russo shortly before his death. Uh, and it, it's about his experience with Nick Rockefeller. So with a very, very elite guy who was trying to, who was telling him, hey, Look, he, 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 when he, he told them that 9-11 was going to happen, point by point. And then he said what was going to happen after it, and that we were going to invade Afghanistan, then we're going to invade Iraq. He laid all this out months before. And then he goes and tells him that, what do you care about the rest of those people? Here's what we want to do. We want to control everybody. We want to vaccinate, he said, 
chip them, but it's the same thing. We want to have everybody under our control. And he says, why? He said, you know, you got all the money in the world. You got all the power in the world. Why do you need that? But that's the other part of the clip that I'm not going to play. Here's the part of the clip that, that I'll play and then I'll talk about. It was done to create a fear in the American public, right? So that, that we will obey what they want us to do. And the very first, take Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. Here's a guy who was six foot six, ugly as could be. I heard he smelled, okay? He sits in coach on a plane, lighting matches to put his shoe on fire, surrounded by people. It's idiotic. If you were going to blow up a plane, you go into the bathroom, you close the door, and you put your shoe on fire. You're not going to sit there surrounded by people lighting matches. Okay, so I love these long way around the barn kind of things. But here's my point. You still take your shoes off when you fly. Mm. And when people say that it's going to change or maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel, I just remind them, you still take your fucking shoes off. And the reason you take off your shoes, remember, is because of this one idiotic, crazy, obviously operation guy who goes and does this as Aaron Russo talks about. So my point is the, the, the real only way out of this is love, is love, compassion, and being that point of light, being that gladiator for light and not hating on anybody and not hating on the evil that is behind this because that don't work either. That's their game. Now you become one of them. Exactly. Exactly. You become one of them. And I think so many of us are one step closer to saying, I'll make that fucking trade. Let me grind that guy into the ground. And I think because I think good always wins, that's always the way the story ends. And because I think, as our friend Miguel Connor pointed out, evil always turns stupid. And we see evil turning stupid right before our eyes. I think that there will continue to be a light emerging from this. And I think it will begin to emerge in 22. But I don't think it's going to come in packaged in the way that most people think. I don't think it's going to be particularly pleasant because I think these guys have a lot of, a lot of bullets in the, in the chamber that they can fire that, that we have to be aware of. Yeah, well put. So, have yeah. we have we done it? Have we done our our job? Uh, on let me brag. Uh, I remember one prediction I made last year. Everybody thought Trump was going to pull it off, uh, but uh, when you pushed me for ending, I, I I laid out. I love scenario thinking, right? So I laid out different scenarios. You 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 didn't like it. You wanted me to stick to a outcome, and I said he's not going to make it going to be Biden. Ah, I was right about that one. <laughs> and you didn't push me now, so I don't have to, you know, e evaluate next year. But the well, reason that, that... I think we should be accountable for our predictions is that if we are daring, and it's our responsibility as host, right, if we are daring to make an analysis, yes, it's not precognition, it's an analysis, we should substantiate what it's based on, right? And, and, um, yeah, we should we should point to a lane and, and say in afterwards, why didn't it happen like that? Or, or why did I think it went like that? So yeah, that's all I'm, I'm saying. Well, that's a good one. I think you should point to that. Of course, he didn't really win. I mean, they rigged it in the most dramatic way fa possible, which is kind of interesting. But I think your your point is super. You, you totally got that prediction because the prediction was Trump wouldn't make it, Biden would pre prevail. And I think it's, mm. he, he did. It was the it's incredible what they, what they pulled off. It was so, you know, I, I recently interviewed uh, Steven Snyder from Recluse, who you're going to interview on your show from the Farm Podcast. 
Great. I, I love what, what he said when I asked him that question, because he's kind of a little bit more of a left-leaning guy. And he said, just what surprised me is how in your face the, the rigging of the election was, how obvious it was. And I think he is spot on. It's, it's not the surprise that they rigged the election. They rig all the elections. It's just that they did it in a way where they had 106% voter turnout in Wisconsin. And you don't usually get that. And they, they, you don't get it where it's reported, you know, but anyways. <laughs> yeah. No, it goes to the a bigger uh, tendency. Uh, I discussed this with uh, Stephen Schneider, actually, when I had him on. And the show is just not released to, to neither the public nor the subscribers yet. It's waiting with the 15 other shows in editing. This one will be pushed ahead, by the way. <laughs> but he said... We discussed, uh, w w look, look, he said, the elites today are so stupid. They're more dumber than they were used to be. And that's a point you and me have flushed out earlier, if you remember. And um, so, because I, I said, is it that, or is it that just that they have now so much control that they're just being brazen about it? They're not pretending. Back in the day, they were pretending, even though the, we didn't have internet or anything. There was a certain standard you had to to try to maintain, like a, a not a believability. What's the word? But you know what I mean, right? It, it, believability, it I think, is perfect. Okay, yeah. so but they don't have that anymore. Is that because the, the incompetence is so extreme, combined with the extreme power, or if it be, is it because the power is now so extreme? It doesn't matter if people know what's going on. In many ways. You, you, are, you are excused for having that view because look at the Assange case. The Assange case isn't about Assange, it's not even about Wikileaks, it's, a, it's about everyone else. It's about, if you even try to entertain the thought of fucking with us, we're gonna screw you six times from Sunday so deep that just a shell of a human being will be left. Know your place, know your lane, we have taken over. It's done. This and Assange isn't the only one. You have uh, Stephen, this lawyer in New York now, Don Singer. Look into that case, folks. It's incredible. That's the law system. Uh, just exposes the American uh, judicial system for what it is. So, I'm not sure, Alex, and I want your uh, input on this. Is it just the an extreme incompetence and stupidity and arrogance? combined with their extreme power now because of technology and all that? Or is it that they just don't care anymore? Because they always, I said to Recluse, I said to him, Stephen, I said to him, look, yes, the elite is more inbred and stupid than ever, but they hire experts. That's what they always do for anything they want to do. They find the brains. We've talked about that too, Alex. They finance certain things that we want it to go in that direction. So there's not a lack of brains out there. And there's not a lack of opportunity to turn the brains onto their team and work for them. That's what most of us do anyway, right? So, uh, yeah, that's the big question. What do you think? I think you make a great point. And it's well, I didn't, I, but I want you to say which one of those two is well, it the stupidity the, or is it? I, I think the point that you make is you can be stupid and hire smart people if you have money, and if you own the printing press that prints all the money, it kind of affords you a lot of opportunities. But at the same time, I agree that there's a certain sloppiness that I wouldn't yeah. immediately dismiss as. Uh, brazen in your face i don't care if you know it some of it just looks sloppy it looks mm. like it has no nothing to gain by being sloppy i don't know why you run this operation and israel is the zionists are one of your allies and they become the most jabbed people on earth with more <laughs> boosters than anyone else mm. that i don't know how that fits into your pl did you really plan on doing that and uh, the people in africa and brazil and these other countries they're not not so much india not so much you know mm. was that part of your plan no that wasn't part of the plan they'll be able to recover and and do that but you know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to yeah, get too yeah. far afield here because we've got to wrap this up. But yeah. no, I, I think your your larger point, both those points that are kind of intertwined with what you're saying, I think are important is 
no, they're not that smart. But don't count them out because they can still hire some brains. Yeah, they always uh, turn to brute force when a manipulation game doesn't work. Yep. Mm -hmm. What a sad note to end on. Well, we don't know how the game gets played, but we know who wins in the end, and who wins are the people who stay true to the to the light, to the That's light right. in their heart, because That's, right. that's the only thing that matters. You beautifully said it earlier, this exercise we're in is a preparation for a transition. It can't be otherwise. That isn't even that isn't even esoteric or metaphysical. It's just fucking common sense. How can it be otherwise? How else would it make any sense? So that's that's where we really come together, you and I, Al. And you know, when you stay anchored in that kind of reality, everything else kind of becomes a lot easier to deal with. Oh, man. And let's not forget this uh, life we're living. It's just a drop in the big cosmos. It's just a... It's, it's, it's what Shakespeare said. Life is a scene, something like that. Uh, so are, let's not lose we are but perspective. actors on the stage. Yeah. 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 So let's not lose perspective either that we are here to learn something, experience something, and what we take away from it. It's really what's matter. That's why you and me are trying to peek open the door into the other side so we can get some reassurance of the bigger perspective that life isn't just, it's, it's not just one and one day, it's many, many days. It's not just one and one moment or life, it's many, many. So the battle is, oh, is huge, it's long. It's so big, and I don't know, maybe Gandhi is right, maybe the path and the goal is one. You can't distinguish. That's why the means never uh, excuse the goal. In other words, the meaning of life is the path itself. Beautifully An old said. cliche, but, but yeah, I, I, I think it's true. Beautifully said, and then maybe that's where we should leave it. Yeah. My friend, it's been awesome. This yeah. will become a tradition. It's so enriching for me. What a great way to Likewise. feel that I've wrapped up the year. So thanks so much for doing this. Mm -hmm. And Happy New Year. You too. Thanks again to Al Borealis for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this show is, what was your favorite Skeptico or Forum Borealis moment of 2021? Let me know. Track me down. Find me. Okay, 2021, you're gone. 2022, bring it down. We're ready. Till next time. Take care. Bye for now.